All right, we can actually talk content now. <laughs> uh, what was the thing that you wanted to tell me? Well, so, uh, oh, yeah, I was, so I had, like, a an interaction at work recently where we were discussing building out a new kind of, not exactly, not a dashboard, but a new way of kind of assessing how um, our outfit algorithm's doing. Because as you can imagine, it's not just, like, are people buying things on the page where we show outfits, but there's also just, like, outfit quality in itself is like a, like those are metrics that we care about so mm-hmm. like are the outfits cohesive what's making up the outfits like how are items being used stylistically is there like a wide range of options per outfit um and so we're we've been talking about building it and it's interesting because it's kind of this work is still in its infancy if you think about you know the longer run and so I was grateful for all the things we've kind of dissected and the ways we articulate things here because pretty quickly in the conversation, I was like, you know what? I think we're on the spectrum from stability versus flexibility, you know? Uh, okay. I personally need a really flexible system because I'm, you know, like, I'm trying to be creative about what data do we collect and, you know, like, hey, we collected data for these specific items and let's look specifically at the metrics for those items and see how they changed and like i might want to dig in and you know so i just need like my full analyst like power to assess stuff versus for the other people on the team they're like needing to rapidly iterate through experiments so it's like hey we decided to change these parameters or we like upweighted this stuff and we need to just run a report in order to show people like we didn't impact these metrics or these things worked in this way or like we saw this improved cohesiveness or whatever and so I was happy because, and I mean, I don't think it's just this podcast, obviously. Like, I feel like this is just experience in general, but it was a moment where I was like, man, I'm really glad I had that way of articulating it because it made a long conversation very short. Uh, okay. Well, how can you maybe just help me explain how it would have gone previously? <laughs> well, so we were, so we, I think this is like we were caught in how the conversation would have gone potentially forever, right? which is like we were kind of going back on features and I was like like imperfectly articulating like, oh, well, I kind of need this or I need that. And then the person who's kind of was driving was like, well, okay, I don't want... Because th- I was eventually I was just like, let's just have two code bases because like, you know, what you're talking about, it's more of like a pre-production step and it would make more sense in Python or whatever and like... I was like, I really can't do this type of work in Python. Like, I, we were trying to figure out, I was like, can we have a shared package that I could import with Reticulate, but then, like, do my own stuff? And we were trying to figure out, like, what could be shared components. And then I kind of just, at one point, was like, I don't want to slow you guys down because your use case is real and my use case. And But then we were kind of going back and forth on, well, but we don't want to have, like, repeated code here and there and, like, like what could we do? So I think it could have been an endless feature request thing. Where uh-huh. it's like I see. Oh, they need this and I need this. And they just fundamentally never were gonna come together because the use cases were so different. Right. And so I remember early on when I was working on this project, the kind of outfit project i was talking to someone about that because there's such an impulse to be like i just want to write the code once and i want this system to scale perfectly and i talked to another data scientist uh chris Marotti, on our team um who's i really like (laughs) he's like awesome and he he just kind of was like you know listen it's okay you're gonna rewrite the code like you're gonna have to refactor this thing and that's just something you should accept like you can't anticipate every single thing and you can't anticipate every way this project could go so like just be comfortable with that and build what you can and try to future proof but you can't get your gears locked trying to perfectly future proof everything so it was an interesting moment of like you know what i think the the situation actually necessitates two systems and obviously we should constantly be figuring out how to bring them together but also we need like an explore phase where everyone has the ability to kind of iterate to what they need for to solve their problem 
it was a good moment because I feel like we have a much clearer path forward where it's like, okay, you guys focus on your case. I'll focus on mine. We'll keep an eye on each other's stuff. And then maybe one day, once this problem matures, we'll know what is like uh, generalizable parts versus specialized parts. Right. Yeah. Well, do you think that like when as com- as companies kind of mature in general, there's a tendency to kind of approach problems, all problems as like mature problems, you know? Yeah. And I don't know if this is, a, well, I don't know. I think this is a big difference between engineering and this flavor of data scientists, or it's almost like a personal thing to some degree and the culture. Cause I know, I think engineers are probably trained to rapidly iterate and like you're dealing with much tighter deadlines. And so you have to work through blockers really quickly. And usually that means kind of doing your own thing or, but you're right. You're right. That would be an engineer in kind of a startup situation versus an engineer at Facebook probably wouldn't have that degree of flexibility um, to be like, we'll just do what we can. And later we'll figure out how to address the tech debt that we've created. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I'm not sure. I feel like people more experienced in the field than me would have a good perspective there. Well, you're quite experienced with yourself. Yeah, I know. In tech, I'm like a gray beard. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of, uh, actually, this just reminded me that we have some follow-up. Oh. We have follow-up on COBOL. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, a very illuminating Twitter thread. Well, I'll just, so I won't make a, I won't make a meal out of this, but I think we talked about COBOL last, in the last episode, and how there was like a demand for COBOL programmers. Mm-hmm. And then what happened? Then someone listening to the podcast, Eric, I can't remember his name now, tagged someone else who apparently is like a COBOL programmer. And then that person had like a 14 tweet thread <laughs> about, or something like that yeah. about why COBOL is like still used and is in fact useful. Yeah. And uh, Nathan Smith, he's the person who uh, had the long thread and is the COBOL programmer. His description is uh, mainframe database administrator. Well, so I think, and I kind of was like, Roger, you'll need to explain things. I think I fundamentally do not understand what a mainframe is in a in a deep way (laughs) yeah it's not i don't i can't say i've like run into them (laughs) on the street but like is it a computer like i like i literally don't i and obviously i could have looked this up but i don't understand the hardware or the software involved I, I, yeah, I mean, I guess in my mind, a mainframe is a computer. Yeah, that's what I thought too. It's like a big computer, but it's huge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I and I think you know, as opposed to say like a bunch of computers that are wired together, right? Yeah, like the cloud. And I think the main difference there being that the wiring is internal as opposed to external. Right. Uh, okay, that's kind of what I was thinking too. Yeah. Yeah. I may be wrong about that, but we'll go with it for now. <laughs> I mean, essentially, my takeaway from what he was saying was that, like, you're talking about a level of computing power that you just can't get from other applications or something like that. Well, I think it is also it's the nature of the work that these mainframes are asked to do Mm -hmm. is is specific. And he mentioned specifically kind of uh, what do you call transactions, I think. I was going to say, yeah, like bank transactions. It sounded like that was a major application. When I say the word transactions, most people today probably think about like database transactions, um, which I don't think is the same thing, even though they use the same word. Yeah. There's probably, I mean, there's such a different SLA for like, you deposited this money and it shows up in your account. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so like, I think that kind of thing obviously goes back, I mean, banking goes back a long way. And um, (laughs) I think, (laughs) and you can imagine how often those kinds of events occur in any banking system, right? And so there needs to be a system to kind of like record all these events quickly. And um, I mean, you cannot have a failure. Like that would be a true disaster to have a failure. Because like money would disappear basically. Yeah. I remember one time I deposited money at the bank, and I still don't totally get how they caught this, but I wrote the wrong amount down. Like, it was a genuine error, um, and I was depositing cash, and, 
like they went and corrected it like it i was just impressed i was like wow it's not just like oh we take it at face value what you've written on this sheet <laughs> like so it like originally showed up the amount i wrote down but then they like went and corrected it later and i literally was like i don't even know how they do that do they have like a like they have a checking system somewhere right that, like yeah. Yeah, an auditing system somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so the basic crux of the thread is he says, you know, the reason why mainframe applications are still around is because they can handle a massive amount of transaction processing. The business applications aren't necessarily performing complex calculations, but there are just a lot of them. And again, it's like there's part the the impulse in me is like, yeah, but clickstream data, I mean, oh, my God, like there's so much more clickstream data than there are bank transactions. Well, I guess that's a good question. I don't know. Are there? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's like human generated data versus machine generated. I mean, in astrology or astrology, in astronomy, like, I mean, like the real big data is that is like astrophysicist, right? Well, okay. So the question is not whether there exists more clickstream data. The question is whether there is a single computer that has to handle all those transactions. Oh, for sure not. Right. Yeah. And I think that is. And you can have outages and lose stuff, and that's like, okay. Right. I mean, it's not great. Like, it's a big disaster, but it's not the same as, like, oh, our whole system of monetary exchange has, is like fundamentally flawed, <laughs> and there's like a huge meltdown right. in economies. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the question really is like, if you were to redesign the system today, would you do it the same way? And I don't know the answer to that. Well, I mean, I mean, like the financial system, right? So, like, I don't know what the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. I just have no clue what the technology is, and I have no clue what the SLAs are. And I literally don't understand what the consequences, even though I, I know they're probably really bad, I don't know what the consequences are of, like, failures. Right. And I don't know if they've ever happened before. I'm sure it has, yeah. And I don't even know who's, like, saying that this can't happen. You know what I mean? Like, I like I guess it's, like, the Fed or the World Bank or I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't understand any of this. Um, I, there was one tweet that I thought was interesting. He said, the nice thing about working in this kind of job is that you can read code that was written in like 50 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he said he found some code file that was date stamped March 1969. That just reminds me of when I was at that our conference, like not even a conference, like meeting um, with, with uh, Robert Gentleman, right? Yeah. Or no. Yeah, and he was showing like the first kind of napkin they'd r- written on, essentially. <laughs> like describe and it was like it was so great because he had like the date I mean, anyway uh, describing what would become i guess s that became s plus that became r oh that must have been john chambers then yeah john chambers yeah that's right and it was just like a little diagram of like here's what we're thinking there's like a ui for the algorithm yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway i'll put a link to that thread in the show notes but it was interesting yeah I do, man. I mean, I don't know. I wish I could. My life would be better if I understood computer science like a hundred times better than I do. You know what I mean? Like the history of it and like even just the terminology people. Like I I had another meeting, actually the same meeting, um, where a couple of coworkers were talking about like a golden set of clients and I had no clue what they meant or like why it would be important, but it was essentially just like you like when you're QAing, there's there's the advantage of QAing just like randomly sampled people, but then also you kind of want people who you've seen evolve over time, um, so that you get to know them better or like you know you just like understand a little better what um, the changes to your algorithm are doing. And it made me realize, like, this is probably just a concept in computer science. Or, like, it it seemed like a general concept that people with that background and, like, maybe just production ML um, had in common that I was, like, totally missing. Um, and, I mean, there's other things, too. Like, I, it's like every word is different for the same concept between computer science and statistics and economics and like everything (laughs) and so it's just like man i wish i just understood all these vocabularies but (laughs) all this just takes time but what at what cost though that you have to like not understand something else right yeah well does it work that way i mean there's a lot i could cut out like my understanding of like the history of grumpy cat or like (laughs) you know (laughs) it's not essential knowledge 
I know a lot about the origins of Grumpy Cat, and it is not pretty. <laughs> but that makes you you, though, right? Does it? Well, I, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, this will be a good segue for my uh, my next topic. You you want to brag about something, right? No, no, no. Oh, the no? brag was that I handled that meeting. Oh, know. that was the same thing? Yes. Uh, that was the same thing. I have a different, much more pensive topic next. But I also want to give you time to... <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I did want to talk about one thing though, which is which has been spawned by our whole work from home situation. Yeah. Okay. I think this will be. I n- knowing a little bit about what you're going to talk about, my thing will segue just as easily from that. So why don't you go? Okay. Thank you, Hillary. <laughs> a rare moment <laughs> yeah. where I let someone else talk. So I think you know you work. In an office, right, with, like, there's people around you, right? Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. people that you work with are around you, I guess just say. Yeah, like, we all sit in the same pod. Right. As do I. I mean, I talk to the people I work with face-to-face, right? Yeah. You have your own office, though. Yes, but we have meetings, etc. right? Yeah. And often, you know, we have to hash out statistical kind of problems, right? Should we do this model or that model? Should we do this analysis or that analysis? Or, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. And I and I find that kind of discussion just infuriating to have over email, right? Absolutely. It's just, yeah. And it's not a question of like, oh, someone doesn't understand something or someone is like too stupid or whatever. It's just like, for some reason, well, maybe you can help me with this because it's like, it's like impossible to, re- to kind of succinctly relay concepts over email Mm. like of like this over email and on top of that of course like you can't really write equations and and then it's like and and sometimes that's like so i i was inspired to talk about this because i'm having this debate and even over the phone it's like hard to do i mean over like a Mm -hmm. conference call kind of thing um yeah i having we're having this debate over like what kind of model to run for some study and we're we're like grant grant granted the topic is subtle but it's like should we use a marginal model versus or a conditional model okay and like and i'm like so i have to exchange emails you know back and forth with someone about this and like the pluses and minuses of different approaches and it's like i'm like i'm dying is what i'm saying yeah (laughs) you should use like we've had to do a bunch of remote interviews and there's technology here. So, like, you can have, a, like, a whiteboarding session with someone remotely. Yeah. Yeah. It requires them to adopt the technology, which is, like, it's a lot easier to force someone to in an interview setting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it would benefit in that you could, like, write things out. I don't know if it's, like, point and click. I guess it kind of is. But you could, I'm sure... You know, you have an iPad. I'm sure you could think of a very creative solution for this. No, there is a way to do it. Um, but, well, first of all, you have to initiate, like, a call, right? Which, you know, I don't always want to do, right? <laughs> or nor do I always have time to do it, right? Yeah. And so sometimes you're like, okay, I don't have time to, like, synchronize, so we'll just do this over email, right? Oh, but it's email. That should never be the logic. <laughs> email will always take longer, like, period. Well, I know that now. Yeah, yeah, you had to learn that one the hard way. But you know, my my the problem is my meeting time right now is extremely limited. Well, yeah, you're. I mean, this is such a unique situation. Well, I know this is why it's coming up now, right? I mean, I think normally I would have been like, let's meet for half an hour, and I'll walk across the street, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and for me, I can still do that because I don't have. I'm accountable only to my cat. <laughs> <laughs> Who is very demanding. Let's but, be clear, uh, yes. not the same as, like, a child. And also, I think, you know, even with, like, whiteboarding sessions, like, on Zoom, for example, like, there is just a bit of an issue, because, like, depending on how many screens you have in your life, um, like, sometimes you want to, like, write stuff down, but sometimes you also want to, like, show data or show tables or whatnot. And it's, like, having to switch back and forth is just, like, it's not always that easy anyway. Especially because, of like, he has the tables, but I have the whiteboard. You know, like, you have to... Yeah. yeah. Anyway, but no, it's not easy. But it's like it's like a new language. Like, but you can become fairly fluent in it. I guess so. I'm not though. <laughs> oh yeah, totally, exactly. And like, nor am I. But I think that like with the remote interviews and like, oh, like we've had to more rapidly adopt that, just because we have more pressure to adopt it. Versus, you would have to like somehow convince the other person that the pressure's there and you're just not gonna be able to do that like 
like in a tech setting, I think that's much easier. But in a non-tech setting, I mean, well, what makes you think it's easier in a tech setting? Oh, because there's more of an appetite to like learn something new, you know, or like, um, I mean, I know that all my other coworkers are like also interviewing or you know it's just like there's more reasons to there's more pressure to adopt everyone is in a mode right now where they're trying to figure out all these subtleties and so telling someone oh like let's try this thing they'll probably be open to it versus i think the focus is just different for your collaborator and you well it's not so much a technology adoption issue i think it's Mm -hmm. more just i just certain kinds of conversations where you're debating method a versus method b Mm -hmm. require like a huge amount of iteration right and where you talk about the pros and the cons and the you know pluses and minuses etc right and uh, you know that kind of and that kind of iteration is slow enough when you're like talking in person to each other, right? Yeah. But it, at least it works, like I think, for the most part. But then, like every step, kind of remove that you like, whether it's on the on the phone or through email, like just slows that iteration down so much, right? Yeah, like, yeah. And um, and I just can't. I just like it. Just drives me. It just drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah, and I should say that I haven't had to do that i'm so with you like when they're email i can just tell it's fun for people like there are people i work with who it's fun to send emails it's fun for them to send emails kind of like talking about methods and again i still kind of believe that i am no longer a data scientist because (laughs) when i get those emails i usually like mute them (laughs) because i'm just like i cannot like i don't care and i don't i don't want to get sucked into this and I can't I it's to me it's like a hindrance because it's like I every time for me the answer is what's the simplest thing we can do and so these emails like are not about that they're kind of about what how can we complicate this and (laughs) it like triggers me because I'm like we need to just do the simplest thing like there's no debate in my mind and so I yeah I can't. I kind of can't stand them. <laughs> yeah. The other time this comes up for me a lot is when I'm writing grants, and like often there's a big team, and uh, and you have and we have to debate like what's the analysis going to be, and this is like before there's any data, obviously. So now it's even like a little bit more abstract, um, and so we have to debate what the analysis is going to be. And often it's like if it's a big grant and people are spread across like six time zones, like you're never going to get everyone together, right? And um, and it's like, and you just have to debate it over email. And it's like. (laughs) Mm. Well, I think probably what's happening more than anything, I mean, not to just like, like, I don't know, I feel like I'm kind of reiterating my point, but it's like you really have to differentiate what are people doing because it's necessary versus what are they doing because it's fun for them. Oh, no, no. It's interesting. So like, you're totally right. Because like, Sometimes I'm on a grant and it's like I just write the thing and there's zero debate because I'm really the only kind of statistician yeah. on the grant and everyone else is like in a different field. And so they just, you know, they read it over and they have some questions and that's it, right? And then it's like some grants that I'm on where like everyone's kind of interested in like the methods, you know, and that's the worst. <laughs> well, it's like bike shedding. It's like, oh, everyone, it's like a fun thing that you can wrap around, you can wrap your head around and like, yeah, it's an opportunity to prove how smart you are. And it's like, <laughs> I, I, like, it's just, I mean, again, I, I need to work on my like empathy for that. Cause, and I think it's like, it's like, you kind of hate the things you used to have or, you know what I mean? Like, right. <laughs> Where it's like, yeah, I used to do that, and now I don't. And like, so now I, it's like hard for me to conjure empathy when people are doing it, right? Um, and so, because it's like my self hatred comes out. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole deep internal struggle there. Yeah, exactly. It's like I got over this. Why haven't you? You know, the point of this conversation. There's no point to this conversation because it's not like I have some solution. I just, uh, you know, I just had to vent. I mean, I don't know. I think that it's like. You need moderator. Like, you need someone to kind of gently call people out and be like, is this necessary for... Like, let's talk about the consequences of this. Like, the things you're talking about. If it's a grant, do you really... You can change what you're going to do, right? Oh, I guess with the grant, you're more talking about, like, how do we even pitch this? But... Yeah, and, like, what will the reviewers, you know, want or not want? That kind of thing. Yeah. 
So. I mean, I think this is where I'm like really inspired by PMs where when these things come up, they are never thinking about the content. They're always thinking about how do we resolve this ASAP. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, okay, why don't you each work on it? And then we'll like, let's figure out the like, it's like the persuasion, the getting to yes. It's like, okay, we have a conflict. What are the best ways for us to come together? Maybe each of you work on it. You agree on objective criteria ahead of time, and right. then you can evaluate it. So don't spend any time talking about methods. Spend all the time talking about what's your objective criteria of success, and get people aligned on that, and then the debate will like work itself out. In this case, there were, unfortunately, some... <laughs> Criteria for success that I didn't think were acceptable. <laughs> well, yeah, and so then that's the actual content, right? And, and that's a tough one because that's a debate that occurs at a higher level. Well, yeah, and so then it's like, okay, it's funny because I was just talking about this in a different context, but it's like, okay, so then the issue is that there's a lack of alignment above you, so you need to just punt the conversation up there, like. Don't engage because that's the conversation now. Part of my problem is that it often I I oper- I have to operate at different levels, right? I like I have to operate at a management level, but also at like an analysis level. Well, and, yeah, and this is why academia sucks. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I have to fill multiple gaps in the uh, com- yeah. in the, the chain of command. Yeah, it's like it's like the the fundamental theory of academia is that like y'all just get in a room together. Like there's no hierarchy. Right. And there's right. no top level decision maker. Yeah. We're like a startup, man. You know. Yeah. <laughs> That was a great voice. I don't think you do voices like that. That was like my startup CEO voice, I think. I know. But are you doing voices because I do them? You know, that one just like, it just came out. I don't know. Like I know. This is what happened to me. I had another friend who did voices a lot. And then I I did them a little bit, but they got like majorly amplified because I was like, I love that rhetorical. <laughs> I didn't think this through, but I was like, oh, yeah, I started doing it because I thought it was really cool when Cece did it. Like, <laughs> I think it might be because of you. It's possible. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, you're a startup man. Because <laughs> you know all my experience working in startups. It's like it's just I, I every time I hear that I just think of GitHub and their like lack of HR and I'm like, what a total mess. <laughs> <laughs> We're just a startup. Like everyone's equal. We don't need hierarchy. We don't need managers. Oh my god, we have like a total HR meltdown. Right. How did that happen? <laughs> no one could have <laughs> predicted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. Horrible. Oh, man. Um, what was I going to say? Okay, that's all I had to say about that. How does this segue into your topic? Oh, well, okay. So it segues into my topic. Topic. I've talked a little bit. I think I've maybe only once brought up this podcast called Your Undivided Attention. Oh, okay, I don't remember. Yeah, maybe I didn't even. But it's a podcast about... So there's this guy, shoot, I was going to make sure I got his, for some reason, even though he's totally like an influencer, like he has, um, he's done TED Talks, like I think he was a TED fellow, but I cannot remember his name for the life of me. Tristan Harris. Um, Okay. And he has a co-founder, Aza Raskin, um, but Tristan's sort of like the the figurehead. But anyway, they're... uh, they start he was like working at Google and um his his title was eventually design ethicist. Uh and he essentially has I think this all started, he gave like an internal presentation about attention, like the attention economy and how he was concerned that Google was like he was concerned about how Google was managing their kind of moral obligations from people gathering people's attention. And then that's just, like, exploded, you know, where essentially, like, he, the podcast, the first episode is about how all the similarities between the way tech is designed and essentially gambling. I mean, not essentially, like, the way tech is designed and gambling. Right. Um, And specifically, like, you can think about slot machines where it's like, okay, you pull the lever and things kind of, like you know, da 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 numbers, and then all of a sudden something pops up. And then if you think about Twitter, it's, like, almost the same, where you, like, you, like, pull down, and you see the little circle, and then things pop up, and, like, if they're funny, you know, you're looking for some sort of stimulus when that happens, and you kind of scroll, scroll to find it, and then you get a dopamine rush when you get it, and then you get hooked, and you, like, do it again and do it again. And then because those companies' KPIs are engagement, 
they do they essentially back themselves up or they they back into like dirty tricks to make it happen and i think there's not even a there's not even like no one probably put the pieces together like i still don't know that jack dorsey well i kind of feel like he does but i don't think that they ever like like essentially i think of twitter i think of facebook as like all of a sudden we had all this new terror, like the, the, um, information age happened. The nerds were the first people to be able to like go explore the new territory and like Mark Zuckerberg, the people who found a Twitter, they just like found the drugs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like they went and they, they're like drug dealers. Like they went and found this like highly addictive thing and then they've capitalized on it and they accumulated power because of it. You're silent, so I don't know I, if you're... I wasn't sure. Okay. And, and uh, you want my reaction? Yeah. Uh, I guess I see that. I see your perspective there. Yeah. Well, and I'm kind of reflecting his perspective, too. So, like, they... And it's like, if you look at, like, the design of casinos, they've made, like, a million design decisions about, like like corners like they try to essentially create like a womb like state when you're in front of a a slot machine and this was bonkers but apparently like every night there will be people who have like peed at the machine because they like don't get up like and they'll wear diapers and stuff and like every someone like had contacted them about like every night you see like five or 10 machines out back that they're having to like sterilize. (laughs) And so it's like, they've, they've like created this womb, like, like, like fuge, fuge, say, I don't know how you pronounce that, but like you go into a trance. I don't know. What word are you trying to say? Like F U G U E or something. Fugue. Yeah. It's like a psychological, like you go into like this kind of like, I mean, you you essentially go into a state where, like, you're not present. It's, like, the opposite of being present in the moment. Like, I've never heard that word used in that way. Wow. Okay. I don't... Isn't that the fugue state? Maybe. Yeah. No, I don't... I'm, not, I'm just, like... I think of fugue, I think of, like, a classical music format. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're right. There's, like, two things. There's, like, music and psychiatry. Got it. Got it. And you're right that they have nothing to do with each other <laughs> at least not that i can tell but maybe there's some like deep linkage there i don't know but yeah it's like a stater period of a loss of awareness of one's identity okay often coupled with flight from one's usual environment associated with certain forms of hysteria hysteria and epilepsy <laughs> okay so i guess this is like borrowing that term but like it's like an induced state like that like like it's like using the word OCD when you don't actually have OCD or anyway, right. whatever. Anyway, the point is, it's like, okay, tech is like actually has like the ethics of gambling. You know what I mean? And so how can we have better ethics than that? And so anyway, this guy, Tristan Harris, like gave a talk uh, that I had tickets to and now it's like live stream. So it's all up on YouTube. And it was like. I mean, my jaw was on the floor. Like, I could not believe... Because I have, you know, I've talked on this podcast a lot, like, kind of thinking about mindfulness and creativity and, like... And, you know, like, obviously the mindfulness goes into just my personal life and, like, how I want to exist in the world. And he... It was like he was aligned with that. He was, like, really had this exhaustive understanding of psychiatry... Or psychology and... It was, like, every... Fr- and because he's, like, a TED Talk and he's, like, honed this... I, like, wanted to be able to pause the talk and, like, write stuff down. Like, it was such a high density right. of yeah. insight. Like, unlike anything I've basically ever experienced, where I was just, like, oh, my gosh, this is, like, gold. Like, this person gets it and they have made it very approachable and I'm, like, so inspired. Like, and I think... I mean, I've thought a lot about, like, where my career would go, but I think, like, ultimately, this is the type of work I want to do. Like, undoing the damage we've done over the past decade with, like, the information age. Yeah. Well, the the age is still young. (laughs) He had a quote from E.O. Wilson, I think, of, like, what was it? It's, like, we have uh, primate minds... I can't remember if it was private, but it was like we have like primitive minds, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. 
<laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. And it's like, I think that's absolutely true. Like we still are like fundamentally as like human animals, we still respond to stimulus. Like we're, you know, trying to avoid danger and find food and like every like thing we get triggered into like life or death, emotional reactions when it's not that at all, you know? And so like, like we have like our technology and our world and like the way we interact evolve faster than our like ability to emotionally manage it. And so, and that's only gotten way worse with the information age. Yeah. And so <laughs> the segue, like what you're talking about is like, yeah, people getting caught up and getting like triggered in these like subtle ways of like, Oh, like my entire self identity is based on being smart and like, I look for opportunities to prove that because if I don't, I might die. Like I might get eaten like the, I might get cut out of the tribe or whatever. Okay. And so it's like recognizing and deescalating when people are triggered is when you can actually make progress. But it happens in these subtle ways that are like very difficult to undo. And the technologies have almost been built to encourage them. Like, he had a really good quote where it's like, you know, like, in our economy, like, a whale isn't worth anything if it's dead. Like, a tree is only worth something if it's cut down. You know, you've kind of heard that in the yeah, past. right. And with humans, it's like, a human isn't worth anything unless you're triggered or upset or in this, like, fugue state. Because that's when you start generating revenue for the tech companies. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Now, given what you've just said, uh, in particular to, in relation to the gambling analogy or the drug analogy, for that matter, because um, I read, you know, I read a lot of tech blogs and newsletters and et cetera, right? And one common theme is that. So here's my uh, okay. Here's my question about regarding this theme. Do you think that there's any value generated at all by these tech companies or products? Yeah, I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure. That's what I figured. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, I mean, and this isn't just tech. Like, I've talked about sugar, like that. I mean, if you look at the history of sugar, like, it's a drug. Like, this is, it's as nasty as drug. Like, you look at the history of Hawaii or so, you know, and it's like, it is addictive in companies are like, wanting to get it in all our food because it makes their food sell better and no one's taking responsibility for like the fact that type like children are getting type 2 diabetes and that is unbelievable right you know that like literally never happened before it is like everything's a drug you know what I mean? like like all the companies are trying to do like shopping is like addictive you know and so people like retailers have been trying to feed that addiction forever it's not just like oh the information age brought it up like well okay so but there's one critical thing that differentiates the information age from previous ages right was that like no matter how addicted you are to shopping and i you know that can be bad too like previous to now there was a, a reasonable amount of friction involved when it came to like executing on that exactly right yeah um mm -hmm. like you had to go to the store you had to you know their time had to be made you know you had to get cash from the cash machine or whatever right right all that friction kind of like it, it i mean it's in theory it's kind of the same idea but it actually has a big impact right on your ability to kind of execute on these things oh absolutely it's like we before it couldn't necessarily spin as out of control. Although there was plenty of people who like ruin their lives with shopping. For sure. You know? For sure. Yeah. Yes. And so it's not that it didn't happen before. It's just that the information age, and this almost makes, it makes me think a lot about that Claude Shannon documentary, like the person who made the discoveries that essentially enabled the information age to happen. Not that there wasn't, it was getting there anyway, but like that, the fact that that was the figure, like he, it seems quite clear that he would not have wanted this to happen from it. You know what I mean? Like, okay, he was yeah. someone who liked playing with toys and, like, he spent his, like, the last part of his career, like, with, uni like, building unicycles or something. Like, it was a very <laughs> odd, he was like a, an odd duck, you know? 
But, um, but I mean, that's the thing. No one like wanted to do it, but like kind of the blind chasing of KPIs made it happen. And now, again, we have these like primitive minds and the challenges are high, you know? And so the, and so sometimes I do feel like hopeless. It's just like, oh my God, this is too difficult. But I think, I mean, there just has to be a system-wide change. Like, it can't be personal responsibility. That's, like, too much. And there's, like, lots of rules around where you can put casinos. Like, like the the point of, like, well, people debate this. Libertarians don't think this. But in my mind, the point of society is to, like, the point of institutions that we put our trust into is that they're supposed to help us not succumb to that yeah and it, and they have to make the decisions that no that individuals can't come to on their own right exactly uh, yeah. like like the environment for example like protecting the environment right um i mean yeah that's the big one that's like yeah th- a huge consequence of this i think one of the things that you know if you when i i talked about friction right i think generally speaking friction is considered bad right there's no like I think in the yeah. beyond like the physics world <laughs> of like actual friction, um, <laughs> there's generally no. I, I think people feel like there's no legitimate there's no legitimate reason for friction to exist, right? It only exists because of something screwed up, basically. Well, and I'm glad you said that because a lot of the work that they do is like figuring out how to reintroduce good friction, not good friction, fric- like like have companies accountable. Right. For introducing friction yeah. into their products. And yeah. Essentially, that's what regulation ends up being, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. Uh, the other thing is like, which is related, but it's like, it's kind of just a general focus on efficiency, you know? Um, and I think uh, one thing I, um, one thing that I feel like this, the pandemic has kind of revealed is like, a, like in some industries, like a like a, there's like no slack in that system, right? Oh, absolutely. And so, like, yeah. because like a hyper focus on efficiency is good in good times, right? <laughs> but then is bad in the bad times, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like, I was talking, I mean, it's just crazy that all the big department stores, like, within a month, they were laying off like 100,000 people. Like, there was just no cushion. There's no, yeah, and there's no reserve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know, my hope would be like there would be a re- reevaluation of that kind of general philosophy, but I doubt it. But I know. That's where I'm like, man, I hope that this, and I think in some ways it has to happen, but also maybe not. I don't know. Like, well, it's, it can yeah. happen. Like, you know, so like I was on my other podcast, I were talking about how like universities have very few, very little reserves, right? So if there's like a downturn in revenue, like it's bad. Um, and but I feel like the only way you could make that happen, like force universities to like save for a rainy day, is to literally force them, right? I mean, like, is to have like a regulation that just says all universities of a certain size, blah, 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 have to have this much cash and whatever, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Because there's no incentive to actually do that, really. No, and like, and I mean, this makes me think of JJ and the way that he turned our studio into a B Corp, which is like, in fact, you are in frequently universities aren't this way, but like frequently you're in systems that require you to optimize for revenue. So you're actually incentivized to not like, yeah, yeah, you're incentive. You almost have like a moral duty to or not a moral, but like a legal duty or I don't know what you call it, but like your fiduciary duty. Yeah, you have a fiduciary duty that you've committed to. So you would literally if you do something different, you will be fired and they will find someone who do, does the thing. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, getting back to your original point, though, I do feel like, you know, it's like these there is a general sense that like making it easier for you to quote connect with your friends and see the news. And that's like that is on, that can only be better. Right. That can't possibly be worse. Like because you're removing friction, you're removing barriers, you know. Yeah. It's like it's what the people want. That's what they're asking for. And it's like. I mean, again, I think it, they're off, like you're talking about the people who are addicted and looking for a fix. Well, I guess here's a question that I don't know the answer to. At what point was gambling considered bad? I guess in the Bible it was bad, right? So that's pretty wild. That's a while ago. In where? In the Bible. <laughs> oh, oh, funny. Yeah. So that's a long time ago. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, yeah. And like, I mean, if you look at like, you know, Buddhism, 
there's been a focus on this at least since 1200, <laughs> which is, and probably much, much later, but that was when, like, the sect I'm most familiar with, like, came to be. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess I guess we can recognize. I guess the, well, I guess you could say argue well, gambling's still around, right? It's not like we got rid of it, but yeah, um, but we do high, heavily regulate it. Well, and also there's like I mean I think there needs to be like tech anonymous, like like there's like AA, there narcotics anonymous, gambling and I guess I don't know if there's a gambling anonymous, but like I'm sure there is. There are things yeah. that we are like everyone accepts as an addiction. Yeah, and tech still isn't there, and like. I mean, I know that I have been addicted to Twitter. Like, that's not even something that I have any doubt about. Yeah, there, and I know other people who are, frankly. And you can't even have that conversation of, like, oh, I'm concerned about you. Like, because it's, like, the person, no one, they won't, it's not, like, a personal failure that they don't admit it. Like, no one is collectively saying, yeah, this is a problem. Right. Yeah. 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 And so it's very easy to be like, oh, it's just a hobby. Like, it's different than you. But it's like, if you can't be in the moment. Yeah. Well, I think also there's an argument that it's pro- it's a productive use of time. That's the, that's the thing. Like, it's like. Yeah. Because it's like, it's like a work addiction. It's like, oh, yeah, I want to go on Twitter and like talk about work. Like, or, yeah. Or get the news or see what's going on, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, the, like the 24 hour news cycle, people, there was like a talking point that that was bad. So, like, almost with news, it's, like, more acknowledged that it might be bad. Yeah. Well, that started a while ago, right? That started... It started, yeah. So, it's, like, how long does it take before people are... And, like, again, with sugar, we never got there. Like, hopefully one day we got... we'll get there, but we're not there now. Well, I don't know. I think we're there in the sense that we recognize the problem. I think there are huge forces that work against solving the problem, but... Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right, yeah. Uh, I think we are there. I mean, I think... Uh, sort of. I don't know. Sort of. Like, I the people I feel worse with for sugar is, like, the mom and pop stores that are, like, ice cream makers. Because I'm, like, you know, like, it's a passion. Like, it's, there's a whole history of, like, making delicious desserts. And, like, it's so fun. And, you like, there's a candy store near me that's, like, so cute. And I want to support them. But I'm also, like, but I fundamentally think this is wrong at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, so it is, like, how do you moderate, like, maybe it's, like, alcohol where you just have to have, like, moderation. But then, even then, I still am, like, I don't know, I still am, like, not okay with how much it's the alcohol culture either. So it's, like, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> Wait, you don't know the answer? No. <laughs> you don't leave me hanging? The answer is prohibition. That works so well the first time. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. It's like there's part of me that wants to be like, I'm not against drinking, but I like, I kind of am. I don't know. It's just hard. It's hard. It's weird. Like, it, like if you're familiar with the damage just done, it's awful. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so it's just like, how can I like see it casually happening and not have that emotional reaction? So it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, at what place do we say it's okay for you to go into this fugue state? I mean, again, like. Maybe part of what's, like, making me deeply conflicted is that, like, I have great respect for people who went to the monastery and you wear the same clothes every day. Like, you basically remove all opportunities for addiction, you know, and you examine when they happen. And and it goes deeper. It's not just addiction, but you examine, like, all the ways in which you construct your reality and you have to, like, challenge all of it. And so... There's part of me that's like, maybe everyone should live like that, but not really. Like, I don't think that's reasonable, so I don't really... But then I think everyone would benefit from being in that environment sometimes. Yeah. There could be a trade-off, but who knows? It's hard. Like, the one that I would have trouble with is, like, you know, shaving your head. Like, if you get senior enough, like, if you become... Senior is not the right word, but if you become, like, a priest, you need to shave your head. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I couldn't do it. My hair. You draw the line there. Yeah, like, it's hard. But And also, women weren't, like, part of, like, monasteries, really, until it came to America. But at the same time... Or I know... I guess I don't know if that's true. But certainly, it's, like, much more common to have women priests here. But it's also, like... I mean, the point was, like, you, you strip everything away that your ego might be attached to. And my ego's attached to my hair, for sure. 
<laughs> would your ego, if you had to like shave your head, would that be hard for you? Well, we've ha- I've had to cut my own hair, so like clearly I'm not that attached. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But did you just like completely buzz it off? No, no. We just we bought some clippers and just uh, you know just trimmed it a little. But yeah, I wouldn't say it's professional level <laughs> <laughs> trimming. Let's just put it that way. That's why the camera's not on right now. So you know. <laughs> Oh, now I really want to see. <laughs> it's fine. It's all I go. I do feel for men. That's hard because, like, for women with long hair, I should say. Yeah. For people with long hair, it's like okay, like you can't really know. You can notice a little, but like you have to have a honed eye to like figure out like that person needs a haircut. <laughs> um, versus with with like mostly men, anyone with short hair, it's yeah. like so obvious. It's super after, obvious. Like, yeah. <laughs> And it's like your face, you know, it's like so noticeable. Oh, last topic. I almost forgot. <laughs> we have one more topic. I totally forgot. Yeah. Is there any segue possible? There's no <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, sorry, I didn't prepare. This is how well prepared I am for these episodes. I just like randomly jump into different topics. Yeah. You forget and then you're like, oh, I actually had a huge thing I wanted to discuss. It's not a huge thing, but it's just a horrible segue. Sorry about that. Was there more that you wanted to talk about? No, that was it. No, yeah. okay. R4.0 was released. Oh, yeah. That's right. I only want to bring this up just because, well, I mean, it's R, right? Um, and also, big <laughs> big change is that the strings as factors is false now. Whoa. That is huge. It's, so just a brief background here. That's a, that's kind of a breaking change. It's like, a huge breaking change, yeah. Yeah, like so much code isn't going to work now. So the read, most of the read table functions and the read CSV functions in R, if they encounter character data in your, like a, a column that has character data, they immediately encode it as factors. So like categorical variables. And this mm-hmm. has frustrated R users, I think, for at least the last 10 years. Um, it's like a very difficult learning curve. Yeah. It's, it's hard so to understand. It's so confusing. Yeah. yeah. And to the point where I actually wrote, this is like back in 2015, I wrote a blog post called Strings as Factors, an unauthorized biography to explain. Like, I know. I see that link to a lot. Well, not a lot, but it does get linked to. It was yeah. a very popular blog post because like people at that time had no clue like why this is true. It's interesting. I mean, I think it made it very clear why it was true. <laughs> well, anyway, it is no longer true. So now when you wow. read in character data in R4.0, it just comes in as character. Um, and so... If you want categorical data, you have to explicitly convert to factor. Yeah. I mean, I like uh, not to just be the fangirl I usually am, but I like the fact that uh, I think what Hadley's, I've seen him say this before, but it's just like you really, if you have factors, it seems necessary that you should define the levels, like the ordering of the levels, really. Right. Rather than automatically. Yeah. And so I think that that is a legitimate statistical need. Um, the design decision, I understand the convenience, but yeah, the design decision was just statistically wrong. I mean, I don't know. I could see, yeah, I mean, there was definitely a trade off made, but I could see if you came from a world where like all ca- any, like data of that nature was, was almost by definition categorical. Yeah. Um, the, what other option would there be? Right. I mean, like, yeah, that's a good point. Like, I mean, yeah, uh, probably a lot of fields, like, just always, if it's ordinal, they would always encode it, like, one, two, three. Well, I mean, I don't know if that's really the justification. It's more like, if you have, like, so if you have character data, it's always going to be in the form of, like, yes, no, or high, Mm -hmm. low, or, you know, it's going to be... But high, low is a good example where that's ordinal. Yeah, well, I I agree. Oh, I guess maybe I missed your point then. Um Oh, well, I'm just saying that if it's ordinal, like high-low or like high-medium-low, then that in the old system, the factor levels would be defined alphabetically. That's true. Yeah. Which is a little weird. Yeah. Which is which doesn't make sense and would lead to like erroneous statistical. The default makes it too easy to have bad analysis. Right. Yeah. Because you don't. Yeah. Because it encodes them. Yeah. And also, it's like inconsistent. Well, this was not an issue that came up in the past, but as mm-hmm. as R became international, there was inconsistent encoding across different locales. So, like, 
it could be ordered one way in like England and then a different way in Australia. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Well, and yeah, I mean, ultimately, I mean, what I was saying was that if you had your data entry where high, medium, low was three, two, one, right, then it wouldn't have come up. And like, maybe there was just more encoding data that way at the source level oh i see what you mean yeah 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 so that like legitimately whenever there's characters it was truly categorical right but now that is absolutely not the case no totally yeah it's been like that for a long time obviously (laughs) yeah like in a small in a in before the information age i could see a lot more thought going into how you structure data but now it's just like whatever field an engineer came up with <laughs> like a long time ago, probably without talking to you at all. Other big things are the new color palette, which we talked about actually before. Oh, um, so the default wow. color palette is like this horrible array of very garish and bright colors. Yeah. Uh, and the new color palette is similar for backwards compatibility, um, mm-hmm. but is more friendly, I think, towards uh, different times of colorblindness and uh, muted somewhat more muted yes yeah less garish (laughs) oh garish is like every time i hear that word now i chuckle because there was someone who interviewed uh at stitch chicks who we were talking through like how to do certain problems and he went oh if you have a shirt like yours that's garish (laughs) talking to you yeah (laughs) And then and then he corrected himself where he's like, or you know, like busy pattern, but it was like There's no recovery from that. I, there I don't... isn't. Yeah. I mean, I think if he genuinely I I didn't take it as like he's insulting me. I genuinely took it as like, I don't know that we should have this person in a room with like our merch team. <laughs> <laughs> I know like that's a pretty big faux pas in this industry. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I can't even think of that name or that word without thinking about that. <laughs> it's been forever ruined. Yeah. All right. That's the, those are the highlights. I think everything else is kind of like internal details, in my opinion. Internal. Oh, yeah. No, that's huge. I'm going to go and download. Like, I'm like, ooh, I want to see. So I'm going to go download it. And like, <laughs> One internal detail, though, which could be uh, have a major impact, though, actually, is the grid graphic system, which was like optimized, I think. Hmm. Uh, and that in and of itself isn't that important, except that ggplot2 you know, relies heavily on the grid graphics system. Oh, interesting. And, so, and one thing I found, I don't know if this is true with you, but I found that like when I launch like the, like the grid, you know, the ggplot2 graphics are, I think, measurably slower than like the base graphics system, like when you just make a plot. Um, but um, so I, hopefully that would speed that up. Yeah, it's uh, oh, for sure much slower. Yeah, yeah. so... I actually, speaking of releases, I think Dplyr 1.0 is also coming out. It's on the horizon. I think I think they said May, right? Uh, yeah. I haven't I I haven't looked into it, but there have been breaking changes recently to Dplyr, or I don't know, maybe I just experienced them recently. Really? I don't think they're actually breaking, but it's like warning. I think some of them were breaking. It might have been around in in Purr with like map like nesting oh nesting no nesting has changed for sure yes yeah and it's like all my code like doesn't work it's a little frustrating that happened to me yeah the nest on nest kind of uh, thing it got like blown up and i think it's better it's much more explicit and you have more flexibility to do some of the things i've wanted to do in the past but every time i'm like relearning the wheel where i'm like oh what am i supposed to do now like and and I also feel like things like won't work the first time I try them and then will work the second time, which <laughs> obviously is not the way that's I'm sure that's a user error, but I, yeah. yeah, I get very confused. <laughs> I, you know, I almost tweeted this because like, I upgraded to Dplyr, the development version on off uh-huh. GitHub just because I have we're building this online course and I wanted to make sure that nothing broke because like when you go to eventually go to Dplyr 1.0 yeah. and like so I, and I, re, so I re-ran everything and like nothing broke. I'm like, oh, our studio is doomed, right? <laughs> 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 they upgraded a huge package and nothing breaks. That's like, that's that's the beginning of the end, right? This is like, they will be who they hate, not hated, but like, they're going to get beholden to non-breaking changes the way Core R has it. Yeah. Totally. They're, they're the next Microsoft, basically. Yeah. <laughs> 
So I just want to state for the record that I was a little disappointed that like literally nothing broke. In in D Player 1.0 for you? In D Player, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I looked at the change. He had a blog post where it was like the changes and I didn't think they would affect me. Yeah. Actually, I think... I think they, it seems like they added a lot of new stuff, but they didn't really change a lot of existing. There's more around like explicit typing, I think. That was just... That one made sense to me, where it's like you can't merge columns... Oh, that are different, yeah. Yeah, or you can't you can't add rows that are different type. It won't just default to like one of the types. Right, right, yeah. Um, and then there's something else where I did email the team to be like, I think this might break code. <laughs> and I, I did not find where it would. I was just like, maybe you guys should look at this. <laughs> it's like the least helpful email, but whatever. Um, yeah. So any, yeah, that's true. That's coming out soon. A lot of the Big changes, changes. Yeah. big breaking changes while we're all locked down. Actually, there is a section in their blog post called Breaking Changes. I guess I just didn't come up, really encounter any of them. They were subtle. Yeah. Like it, yeah, they were, like I said, I read it and I was like, maybe based on the way I know this one person codes, it could break for him. Like it, <laughs> it was like very small stuff. But um, we're doing a migration at work. It was really hard to have things breaking right now. <laughs> It's just like really on top of all of this, you're gonna break something. Like, you're saying it wasn't a good time. No, <laughs> we just have to migrate a bunch of our workflows, and it's like, it's just it is. It's legitimately hard. I think everyone wants things to just like steady as she goes, you know, <laughs> and like that is not when you're introducing infrastructure changes or breaking changes. That is the opposite of steady. I, I think everything when people are imposing on you right now or asking you to do stuff, it feels like a hundred times heavier than usual. Yeah, I think that's yeah. true. Yeah, so it's like I'm barely hanging on here. Like, how dare you? <laughs> 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 like you're not taking care of me right now no one's taking care of me yeah, yeah. all right is there anything any other news anything else not to discuss? Really. yeah i stopped i completely stopped listening to podcasts how about you uh basically yeah yeah basically i actually i take that back i listen to one podcast which is the how did this get made podcast you're still listening huh <laughs> It is one of the only things making me happy these days. I like I cannot describe they they released a shirt that said quarantine buddies and it was like their logo. It was like their faces which has been a logo in the past but with masks on and I was like I'm getting that cuz they are my <laughs> only friends right now. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Not really, but you know what I mean. I like do. I, they are an ever pre- I realized that I can I've talked about this before on the podcast, just to catch a run up. It's like you watch a bad movie and then they have, it's like improv people. So they essentially have like a, they go back and discuss the movie and they have the talents of like good improv comedians. So it's like an extremely funny discussion. And one thing I realized, because you watch the movie, like you remember movies for a long time. It's not like they erase immediately. Right. And so I realized that I can go back and re-listen and it's like almost as funny as the first time because you forget because it's improv, it's like you kind of forget the jokes. Right, yeah. And so I'm like, yes. Yeah. So I'm like going back and re-listening. Because it's like hard to... You have to watch bad movies. You kind of have to watch a lot of bad movies. Anyway. Yeah. It's such a good hobby. I highly, highly recommend it. Like, you have to have free time. I have, I'm trying to optimize my time here. I feel like putting bad movies into the queue is uh, maybe not no, <laughs> suboptimal. If, if you live alone and you're like need to fill the empty airspace with something other than the voice in your head like highly recommend <laughs> <laughs> and you can't become addicted because you have to pace yourself like there's legitimate t- there's a lot of friction to a new episode because you have to watch an entire bad movie yeah well i think that's true with podcasting in general like it, i think it's just not the nature of the medium Oh, no. People totally say they binge our podcast. Our, well, okay, but over how much time, though? I mean, like... Yeah. Um, I know. I agree. There are there have been people, and it always, I'd say it always surprises me when I when we get these messages that are like, I've listened since, like, episode one. Um, <laughs> and it just, first of all, I cringe to think about this, this old... Actually, you know, I take it back. When we did the review for episode 100, and I listened to some of those old episodes, they weren't as bad as I remember. <laughs> 
I agree. Yeah, yeah. But, I totally agree. Anyway, I just, I've it always... is weird to have someone listening to Hillary from four years ago because I've changed so much as like a human in yeah. that time. Yeah, yeah. But um, what was the point of this? My point was that uh, it just takes more time to do it. Like you can't. <laughs> yeah, you can't yeah. binge like a hundred hour long episodes in a you know in a night. I but I have. I have binge regret with podcasts where I'll binge it and then I'll be like, oh, no, there's no new ones for me. And so... Because you didn't pace yourself, yeah. Yeah. So I, what I like about this is that, A, there's 10 years of history for this, <laughs> for how did this get made. And you literally can't burn through them because they're so much better when you watch the movie. And so that's like a rule I have. I can't listen until I watch the movie. So... It's like even slower to binge it. And you just binging bad movies is like you can't do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> built in friction. <laughs> yeah, the built in friction is that it's not fun always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. We can go for real. 